phosphohydrides, which we've seen previously, are biochemical systems store of energy. This statement actually has chemical meaning. I think it's important not to lose sight of that. That when we say that phosphohydrides are a store of energy, this means that they have relatively high chemical free energy, which means they can promote chemical reactions. And they don't do this through any sort of mysterious sort of mechanism. They do it by installing a good leaving group in a variety of substrates through phosphorylation of nucleophiles. And we'll see how that works moving forward. But I want to make that point initially, that phosphohydrides being an excellent store of energy just amounts to high chemical free energy and the ability to do a lot of reactions. Structurally, the reason phosphohydrides are relatively high in energy is because the linkage between two phosphoryl groups is relatively weak. These POP linkages are relatively weak and easy to break, particularly when water is used as the nucleophile to do it. The most important phosphohydride is surely adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. ATP is a big molecule, but it helps to break it out into parts to understand how it functions. It really has two halves, and as I've drawn it here, the left half solely serves the purpose of molecular recognition. This is a recurring structural unit in cofactors that can be recognized in a variety of enzymes. So there are binding pockets and enzymes, for example, that are purpose-built just to bind the adenosine fragment. A similar fragment is found in NADH, for example. We get chemical reactivity from the right half of the molecule, the triphosphate half. And in adenosine triphosphate, there are three phosphoryl groups which are given names, Greek letters, based on the, their relative position to the sugar in this molecule. The first is called the alpha phosphoryl group, the second is the beta, and the third is the gamma phosphoryl group. Because the adenosine portion is really just for molecular recognition, it's often represented just as A with a circle. And we typically represent each of the phosphate groups individually using P with a circle around it. And these are often yellow just to indicate energy content. Hydrolysis can happen at any of these three bonds shown in black, but it most commonly occurs at this bond or this bond, giving either an adenosine monophosphate if this bit gets kicked off as a leaving group, or adenosine diphosphate if this bond breaks kicking off a diphosphate leaving group. The hydrolysis reaction of ATP to form ADP and phosphate is very exergonic, exergonic enough to power a variety of processes in biochemical systems. From the perspective of fundamental organic chemistry, this reaction is nothing more than nucleophilic substitution. There are a few different ways to think about it, but in essence, it is the substitution of one nucleophile, water, for another nucleophile, the phosphate group. After all, we could imagine this reaction going in the reverse direction and phosphate attacking this phosphorus and kicking out water as a leaving group. This is the favored direction thermodynamically, and it's nothing more mechanistically than a nucleophilic substitution. Another way we can think of this process is as the phosphorylation of water. We've talked about the fact that diphosphates and triphosphates can place the phosphoryl group on nucleophiles, and water is no exception. That's called a phosphorylation process, and when water is the nucleophile, we often just refer to it as hydrolysis, ATP hydrolysis. This reaction is quite exergonic. It's quite energy releasing and therefore spontaneous, about negative 7.5 kilocalories per mole. This means that it can make endergonic or unfavorable processes happen, provided their delta Gs are in the right range. Before we talk about that in more detail, I wanted to look at ATP in the broader spectrum of organophosphoanhydrides to give you some perspective on this. Given the fact that ATP is kind of nature's energy storage molecule, you may get the idea that it's one of the highest energy molecules that nature has at its disposal. But actually, when you look at the full variety of organophosphorus compounds, we actually find pyrophosphates somewhere in the middle, phosphoanhydrides somewhere in the middle. At the very top are acyl phosphates, and we'll see these in action during glycolysis. These are the phosphorus-containing molecules that ultimately give rise to the formation of ATP, right? There's got to be something higher in energy than ATP in order to make this molecule in the first place, and acyl phosphates are essentially one of the ways that's done. Above that even, we have guanidine phosphates, for example, what we get after phosphorylation of arginine, and these two, at least thermodynamically, can be used to generate ATP. 
ATP tends to be more reactive, though, than simple sugar phosphates like AMP with a monophosphate group or a simple phosphomonoester of, say, glucose. This means that ATP can be used to generate these compounds. For example, from glucose, ATP can be used as a phosphoryl source for the generation of glucose 1-phosphate or glucose 6-phosphate. And when we say can, we just mean that the thermodynamics work out.